Okay, I think we shall start now. So a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to the morning sessions of our research e-carnival day three. So yesterday morning, we heard about the extensive rare bone programs and the MyBCC projects, which actually look into the breast cancer management and survivorship care from multiple angles. And in the afternoon, we learned about how Profnik's team utilized mobile applications to actually address and monitor mental health well-being among the young adults. And it was followed by a very insightful and interesting discussion sessions with Prof. Lucy Lam and Ms. Rihanna from Generasi Gemilangs, which we talk about child nutrition on how having a balanced diet involving all eight food groups are crucial, particularly during the sensitive first thousand days of life. And today, we will continue looking into well beings during childhood and adolescence, of which both are the critical periods for growth and development. We are very honored this morning to have Dr. Subashini Jayana and Ms. Desiri with us this morning to share their clinical research as well as personal experience on child behavioral and developmental issues, including autism. So uh, before I introduce our speakers a little bit more, just uh, I would like to again uh, re-emphasize some of the little housekeeping notes. So if you have any questions or thoughts during the talk, please feel free to type it in at the Q&A box if you are on Zoom. Or if you are viewing this uh, on YouTube, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Also, kindly register your attendance via the links that has been posted in the chat box. Yeah. So uh, moving on, so a brief introduction of our first speaker of the day, Dr. Subashini Jayana. She is the consultant developmental pediatrician and a senior lecturer at University of Malaya. And she's currently working at the Child Development Center, or we call it CDC at UMMC, in which she assess and manage children with autism spectrum disorder and other developmental conditions. She is the co-chair and global outreach officers for the Early Career Committee of the International Society for Autism Research in SAR. And she's also the ex-co member of the Malaysia Society of Neurosciences. Besides, she is also the members of Australasian Society for Autism Research, ASFAR, as well as Neurodevelopmental and Behavioral Pediatric Society of Australasia, and Associations for Research in Infant and Child Development. Dr. Subashini's main area of interest is in early diagnosis and intervention for autism. She has written a book with the title of Autism in Short, which is a handbook for parents as well as chapters on child development in the textbooks of pediatric and child health under the University of Malaya Press. So without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Subashini to deliver her talk on developmental pediatric from the aspect of research collaborations and services. The floor is yours, Dr. Suba. Thank you, Lizian. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much to the organizing committee of the Research Carnival for this opportunity to talk to everybody. I'm just going to go and share screen now. Um, just give me a moment to do that. Okay. All right. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Um, thanks again and good morning, everyone. Um, what I basically like to do before I start is just to explain a little bit on developmental pediatrics. So it's called different things in different places. And um, here it's called developmental pediatrics, but in some places it's called developmental behavioral pediatrics or neurodevelopmental pediatrics. And it's the same thing. Essentially what we do is we see children um, for assessments as well as diagnosis and management um, of children with developmental conditions. So children who have autism or uh, also known as autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, learning issues and developmental delay or developmental conditions. Um, and I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of what we do here. But before that, I'd like to acknowledge all the patients as well as their families who without, you know, without them, we would not be able to do any sort of research. And um, at the end of the day, we aim that all our research improves services and improves diagnostic um, procedures as well as management. So thanks again to the patients and their families because they always willingly consent um, and they generously give their time and it's 
uh, it, it's something that um, we really appreciate. Okay, so I'm going to mention a few of our research collaborations. This is one of the collaborations that we've done um, over the last two years, and it's with the Collaborative Research Network for Asian Children with Developmental Disorders. So this is from the website, and if you look here, that's the web link. Um, and it's a, it's a consortium of sorts of six uh, universities in Japan, and this comes under this uh, CRN uh, CDD, um, CRNA CDD, as well as under the United Graduate School of Child Development. And through this network, um, these are the universities that are involved. We are, we are part of the international network. Um, so they've expanded not just within Japan, but they've gone to the region. So through them, uh, basically, we, there's Mahiru University, Philippines Children's Medical Center, University of Indonesia, and this is our University of Malaya team. Um, so Dr. Noor Hamizan Hamza from the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Dr. Aisha Ahmad Fauzi from the same department, Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Dr. Aida Sharinaz Ahmad Adlan, who's from the Department of Psychological Medicine, and I. Um, and this is all from their website as well. Okay, so it started in 2019 when the team from Juji SCD came over. Um, that's uh, Prof. Makoto Sato, uh, Prof. Um, Masaya Tachibana, and their team. They came over and they discussed um, possibly collaborating later on. And I have to express our thanks to uh, Prof. Dr. Muhammad Yazid Jalaluddin. At the time, Prof. Yazid was our Head of Department of Pediatrics. Now he's the Deputy Dean um, of Undergraduate Studies at FOM. And uh, through uh, links with Prof. Yazid, as well as efforts by Prof. Nazira, who's our uh, Director of UMNC currently, and uh, Dr. Noor Hamizan, um, who's basically worked on the MOU, and managed to get that done for academic collaborations. We now um, have links with them and we've done some projects with them. Then the next year, uh, this is early 2020. So this is pre-pandemic, pre-mask mandate. So don't be alarmed. Uh, basically, they were very kind to invite us over um, and we went uh, to Osaka with the other universities and other centers uh, who are part of the team. Um, and they had their first international symposium over there. So we had the opportunity to present whatever research we've done. Um, I'll go a little bit into that later. And subsequent to that, we've continued to work with them. So this is the second international symposium, which was held online. And this was early, Jan uh, basically January this year. So earlier this year. And um, I was fortunate to get a grant from this collaborative research network to work on the translation and validation of the Japanese Keep questionnaire and preschoolers. This questionnaire, um, was developed in Japan by the team over there, but then the aim here was basically to validate the English language translation and also to translate it into Malay and validate that. So this is the Collaborative Research Grant 2020. Um, and thank you again for, for that opportunity to do this because it's not easy getting funding for our type of research, but um, kudos to them, they, they recognize the importance of that and they've, um, they've honored us with the grant. Um, my co-investigators are Associate Professor Dr. Ikuko Mori and Associate Professor Dr. Masaya Tachibana, both from Osaka University. Uh, Dr. Noor Hamizan, Dr. Aisha and Dr. Aida are from UM, they are the Malaysian team. And then Dr. 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 Noor Asya from NIH uh, MOH and Dr. Azlin Zaiti Zaina is from Linguistics uh, Department at UM. So the main objective was to validate the English language version and then to translate and validate the Malay language version. So we completed this um, at the end of last year, but um, now we've basically written it up and we've sent it for review. Um, the relevance of this is that we hope that once this is done, we can then use it in preschool age children with neurodevelopmental conditions and other comorbidities. Uh, because sleep is a, is a universal thing and it's something that we rarely look into. Um, the other reason is because this questionnaire was developed in Asia. Um, so in, in terms of cultural um, adaptability, <clears throat> we suspect it will be more adaptable uh, to our local situation as compared to many of the other questionnaires which were developed in the Western world. Um, some, from some of the results that we found, there are overlaps between the previous results and ours, but um, I won't go into all those details. Uh, essentially, after that, we also hope to make the translated and validated versions available to others. So some of our ongoing projects, 
One is this translation and validation. Um, the other uh, project is um, with the same team, but um, same collaborative research team, but different investigators. The principal investigator here is Dr. Aisha Ahmad Fauzi, and we've worked on uh, basically it's on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on children with developmental disorders in their families. So this was a questionnaire-based study as well. And it was done primarily in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine outpatient clinics for children, as well as uh, the psychiatry clinics for children and our developmental pediatric clinic. Um, and we have a few other studies which we've submitted for review with a few teams over there. So um, hopefully those will uh, get published soon. And we have a few planned projects as well. Okay, so just some other collaboration. This is the INSA Early Career Committee. Um, and we are part of the International Society for Autism Research. We're one of the committees under that. So Kim Carpenter and I are the co-chairs, but there are 13 of us in total. And many of the members are from the US, but we do have members from Australia, um, UK, Belgium, and slightly in, um, out of the US as well. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, the main aim for this is basically that we're trying to forward what, what it is that early career people need because there's a there's a major step off after early career to mid-career. Not everybody stays on and we're trying to provide that support. Um, our mission statement is here. Um, I don't think I need to go into everything here, but uh, as I mentioned, the main reason is to increase representation as well as to support members. And we want to develop a sustainable support system because it's not just sufficient to maybe have mentorship for one thing. We want it to be sustainable and we want to build peer mentorship as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of our initiatives is the Global Representative Initiative Pilot. And we started this in 2019 and we've decided to continue it at least in 2022. Um, we want to expand international representation and we want people from more diverse backgrounds as well because it was initially a very uh, US-centric organization, but credit to INSA, they really, uh, you know, uh, endeavoured basically to expand. Um, so we want to work on local capacity building as well, not just you know links to more developed countries, but basically we want to work on the local uh, research capacity also, where we often lack mentorship. Um, and because of this, we have a few early career global representatives, and we had an open call to INSA, we had a selection process, and we uh, grade our early career committee graded the applications with a rubric. And then at the end, we selected six members from different regions. So they represent their areas. And uh, what they've been doing in the last two, two and a half years is basically trying to garner support within their region, within their, host, their own countries, to try to see whether they can uh, increase those networks. And then subsequent to that, we want to do inter-region networking. Um, and we hope to get more representation beyond that as well. Uh, the other initiative that we've done is the mentoring initiative. So the first cohort was in 2018, and we have one new cohort each year. It's three-tiered. We have a senior researcher, uh, an early career researcher, and then a student training researcher. And because of that uh, pattern of mentorship, the early career person learns both mentoring as well as how to be a mentee. And subsequently, um, we hope to develop that further. And there's an individual development plan for each person, basically to work on what we call SMART goals. So these are targeted goals um, in order to achieve some sort of tangible output. Um, and the aim is to just to give structure and some sort of oversight uh, to ensure that it's not just uh, meet and greet, but we actually get some outcomes as well, which benefit everyone. We also did an early career committee survey where we reached out to members around the world. And all of this is basically electronic. So in some ways, um, the fact that you can do a lot of things electronically has opened a lot of doors as well. Um, and we have been able to get more international participation, which would not have happened otherwise. Um, so things like, you know, barriers, which otherwise would be big barriers, time zones, geography, all of that now are not so much there. Um, and this is a good opportunity. So when we looked at the survey, we found that uh, likelihood of participation was basically, if people were happy to do a lot of things online, but they did want some feedback. So we had a research rapid rounds uh, previously, that's another initiative, where it's, it's essentially like uh, you, you sit at a table with uh, senior researchers and the junior people pitch their research. 
And then after that, they ro uh, rotate again. So you get about two rounds of that. And we did that and that was very, um, uh, the, the response is very positive. But um, subsequent to that, we thought, okay, we now need to pivot to something online. So that is something that we're thinking about maybe for later on. Um, the other thing is topics of interest. Many people were interested in early development and infancy as well as implementation science and translational research and intervention in mental health and autism. Um, the other thing that was flagged was clinic-based research. So we put that in specifically because uh, INSAI was essentially um, a research organization. So the participation from clinicians is quite low, but um, I think that's something that we felt quite strongly about that we needed to look into that. So this means there is a lot of opportunity for work uh, with patients as well, uh, for patients. And, the other thing is, um, you know, RCTs were important, but they weren't as important as we had initially assumed, because I think sometimes a lot of research, if you look from the researcher's point of view, you think this is useful, but you really have to see whether it's useful to the stakeholder, to the, you know, to the patient and the family. And mental health was something else that was flagged as well. So there were also suggestions to improve diversity, which we can look at as well. Um, now I'm just going to go into a few of the publications of the unit. So um, another thing just to point out that developmental pediatrics at UM and UMMC, we come under community, the community pediatrics unit and the head of community pediatrics is Prof. Mary Marin. The other arm of community pediatrics is child protection. So basically there are two arms to community pediatrics and developmental peds is one of them. Uh, this is a paper that you know, I wrote quite a while ago. It's basically on a parent reported pain in children who are non-verbal, uh, who have cerebral palsy. And the, uh, this I did with Prof. Ong Lai Chu from Peds Neurology, Prof. Mary Merritt, our head of community peds, and Dr. Aisha Ahmad Fauzi from Rehab. And we looked at patients um, who presented to the hospital as well as two community centres. Um, and we had more than 100 patients in total. Um, the, the surprising thing was that pain factored in about 65%. So 65% of parents reported pain in their children with cerebral palsy. The ones who had spastic diplegic cerebral palsy and the ones who had more severe impairment, so what we call GMFCS uh, level 5, had more pain and more frequent pain. But uh, pain was also reported during physiotherapy. And of course, as the children were older, the older children tended to report more pain. But I think the, the thing to, to remember is that we found that, you know, this is pain in a group which otherwise would not be able to report it. So that's an aspect that we really should be looking at as well. This study I did with uh, Professor Sally Ozunov from UC Davis Mind Institute. And Prof Ozunov, um, at, you know, when we started our, our mentoring uh, project, Prof Ozunov was picked as my uh, mentor and I was picked as a mentee. So we worked on this project together and that's one of the, you know, one of the ways you can actually link people from different areas to work on things together. Um, so we're very happy about this one. Uh, we looked retrospectively at the patients who presented to our developmental pediatrics clinic. And these were chart reviews. That means we looked at the electronic medical record. Of course, everything went through ethics, but um, because it's retrospective and we had you know, a few years of data, we actually managed to get 366 uh, records in a short period of time. It was over 16 months. Um, and looking at that, uh, what I did was I coded the first parental concern. So the initial concern of parents when their children um, later on went on to get a diagnosis of autism. And this is the assessment tool that was used. So this parent concerns questionnaire is usually used as an interview uh, guide or interview tool. And it's used by uh, Prof Ozanov and her team in her lab. But what we did was we took it to, to score um, the first concerns retrospectively. And um, using that, we, you know, we categorized the concerns based on these. And looking at all of this, speech, language, and communication concerns came out as the most frequent in all the patients. Um, and this was regardless of severity. Uh, also, the children who were diagnosed earlier tended to have more severe ASD or more severe autism. Uh, and, and all of this, I suppose, in a way, is, uh, it's intuitive. You feel that it does make sense. But it's nice to see it actually you know, validated in, in research. And I think the other thing that's important is that we found that there was a time lag between the first concern and diagnosis. 
majority of parents said that they did identify some sort of concern by age three. Most said by age two, they noticed some sort of um, concern, but there were a, you know, a few parents who said that they didn't have any initial concerns and the concerns were flagged by teachers, by other family members. So sometimes these things, um, uh, you know, they, they can be heterogeneous, but I think the, the take home is that speech, language and communication was the main thing. So this may be a universal first concern. And it's interesting because this can be, uh, you know, applicable in different cultures and that fits in with the um, literature as well. So this publication was by Noor Shuhada Saleh. She's a PhD candidate whom I'm co-supervising uh, with Prof Katija and Dr Tang. And she looked at, um, this was from her literature review, so she looked at qualitative studies over a long period of time, actually from 1940 to 2019. She did a database search and then she also looked at citations. At the end, she found there were 12 studies that fit the criteria. And uh, Shuhada and, her, and the co-investigator went through and they basically scored everything. And looking at those results, the pattern emerged that there was quite a bit of stigma and it's affiliate stigma. So affiliate stigma is stigma that um, people feel by their association with someone else. So in this case, these were parents who felt stigmatized because of their association with their children with ESD. And of course, when you think about it, you think it's appalling, like why should people feel stigmatized? But it does happen. And I think we have to acknowledge it. You know, it's probably a failing in society, but it's something that we need to acknowledge and we have to recognize. And um, many parents reported that they felt that they were actually, um, you know, they were ostracized or they felt judged for their children's bad behavior. People blamed them. They said that they were bad parents because they couldn't see any physical uh, impairment in the children. So these are things which, of course, if you're in the medical field, you think, you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Why would people think that way? But we have to remember that when we're treating uh, patients and families, because this is the reality of what they face. And until and unless we acknowledge that, I don't think we can you know, deliver the care that we should and that we deserve. Okay, so uh, this is a study I did with Prof uh, Fung Chung Ni, who's from, who's the head of the Pitts Neurology Unit at UMMC, and Dr. Rajin Savanandan, who's also a developmental pediatrician. Uh, we looked at the vitamin D levels of children who presented to our developmental pediatrics clinic, and it was an observational study. We didn't do it as a randomized control trial because we didn't think that that would be appropriate. Um, so we didn't apply for ethics for that. We applied for it as observation because what we wanted to do is basically it would be treatment. If someone's level is low, we would treat. And if someone's level were not low, we wouldn't treat. So we wanted to just go doing that rather than taking blood unnecessarily. Um, and what happened was we found that 19% uh, of the children actually had vitamin D deficiency and there were most 40% who had insufficiency. So that's reasonably high. We treated the ones with deficiency because they required treatment. Um, and we looked at their behavior before and after. So their autism severity before as measured by the child autism rating scale. And we looked at their behavior and whether there were any behavioral issues as uh, reported by the parents with the aberrant behavior checklist. And we looked at pre and post, uh, both for the children who were treated as well as the ones who were not treated. And the ones who were not treated were the ones essentially who did not have deficiency and did not require treatment. So they were, um, you know, they were compared in that way. The results are uh, mixed. We did find that there were some improvements in the severity, the objective severity of uh, autism after we treated the ones who were deficient. Of course, the ones who were not deficient pre and post, there was no change. But uh, we think that you know, it may not have been clinically um, significant, but it was statistically significant. So that means that you probably need larger numbers in order to test that further. But um, it also, you know, the other thing that we found was that female gender was a risk factor, and that may be due to you know, lack of sun exposure. The other thing, of course, is that we found that the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was very similar for our kids with ASD as compared to typically developing primary school children in Malaysia compared to another study. So that means that, you know, of course, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, hype and a lot of things about, you know, supplements and things like that for ASD, but we're not very sure whether 
they actually are evidence-based because if you look at prevalence of deficiency, it seems to be similar um, whether you have ASD or you're neurotypical. Uh, this was uh, presented as a poster at the INSA meeting in 2019. So the preliminary results were presented then. This is a study um, I did with Prof. Anna uh, from our PITS, the head of our PITS respiratory unit at UMNC and Dr. Tan Le Ping. So Dr. Tan, uh, well, now she's a pediatrician, but at that time she was doing her master's in pediatrics. And she looked at health-related quality of life, as well as the outcome in terms of developmental milestones for children in home mechanical ventilation. And um, well, for home mechanical ventilation, she selected patients who had at least three months of home mechanical ventilation and who were stable. And looking at that group, when we compared the outcomes in terms of their development, as expected, the ones who had home mechanical ventilation were generally lower in terms of their developmental quotient compared to the ones who were controls. So her cases were, she had uh, 60 over cases and then 130 plus controls and she compared them. And um, that was expected. But the one thing that was slightly unexpected was that overall, whether they had home mechanical ventilation or not, the ones who had a parent as a primary caregiver tended to have better speech and language outcomes. So that's, that was an interesting finding, which meant that, you know, maybe there are lots of other things which can ameliorate these sorts of adversity. So even though you, you know, you may be disadvantaged in some aspects because of having a chronic illness, the role of the parents and the caregiver is quite significant. This is a recent paper, um, Mary Merritt's paper with her master's student, Dr. Ang Su Chen, and Dr. Ang has also finished and now is a pediatrician. She did this uh, as her thesis for her Masters of Pediatrics. And um, what was done was they looked at all the children who had abusive head trauma, uh, what we call non-accidental injury, uh, who were less than two years old at presentation and who presented to our centre. Um, and looking at that, we looked at outcomes later on, both in terms of function as well as in terms of development. And this was a retrospective review as well. Um, the interesting thing here again was that, of course, the, you know, as expected, many of the children were young, so the median age was about four months because, you know, with uh, abusive head trauma, infants tend to be more affected. There were more boys than girls as well. Uh, but when, you know, when you look at the outcomes over time, they were scored basically in terms of, say, visual impairment, motor impairment, hearing impairment, cognitive impairment, or multiple disability. And the ones who were picked up very early were the ones who had motor disability. So that was noted much earlier, probably because it'd be more gross and more, you know, more easily detected on physical examination. But the children who followed up for longer ended up also having things like multiple disability as well as cognitive impairment. And um, I think that's important because it highlights that you know, when you look at development, you have to look longitudinally. You may not pick it up initially but over time things manifest and um, where I mean in this case because we were able to look at it at one center we were able to capture that data but it may not be the case in many places so this is why we need to have developmental surveillance okay so I'm just going to give a little bit of an advertisement on such specialty training this is one thing when I came back um, in 2016 from my overseas training, I looked into doing a you know, subspecialty training document and a program for UMMC because I think training, in addition to things like you know, research, publication, output, you need to train people because remember at the end of the day, we are you know, recognition researchers. So you want to be able to provide services more than anything else. So it was approved in October 2017 and it's in accordance with the NSR training program. And the full program is actually three years. One year has to be overseas at a designated center. Now we're lucky because we have two full-time trainees um, and they're, you know, they've been working with us in the clinics and they're, you know, it's, it's really nice having you know, excellent trainees and, and additional people to help. But um, if anyone is interested in full-time training, to become a developmental pediatrician, please get in touch because we, you know, the reality of it is we don't have enough developmental pediatricians and with, you know, detection rates going up, which is a good thing, we, we know that we're not ever really going to have enough. So if you're interested, please get in touch. 
This is the link to the, so I'm being very obvious about advertising here. This is the link to the fellowship training. If you're interested, please have a look and get in touch. So uh, one more thing is in addition to all these things, we uh, also have to not just work in silos and not just you know, work within the hospital at the university. It's important to do a little bit of reaching out. Uh, this was organized by the Malaysian Pediatric Association, and this is the link to the webinar, and it was in July this year. Um, and basically, it was just a webinar series for pediatricians as well as medical officers. Try, you know, the aim was just to upskill and to try to give them a bit more information on detection of autism spectrum disorder, what to look out for, when to refer, what to do, just the initial thing. And this is important because there are many people who work outside uh, tertiary centers and for them if they're in you know in say public health clinics or in their general practice they will see children like this um, who have these conditions and not just autism um, you know you, you see children with developmental con uh, concerns um, everywhere um, and I think the only way for them to get that early referral as well as intervention is if everyone else is a bit more aware of these things as well and um, they should feel a bit empowered to refer because I think one of the frustrations uh, for families is that they take a long time to come and see us and of course it takes a long time because you know we would like to see more people faster but then it doesn't do justice to the patients and the families if we rush through assessments because these things take time so one assessment can take at least an hour and a half sometimes two hours for a new patient and follow-ups can take half an hour to 45 minutes. And these are just averages. It varies, of course, depending on level of complexity. So what people should not be doing is they should not be waiting and doing nothing until they come and see us. They need to get referred for the right things at the right time so that by the time they come and see us, we can you know, do the full diagnostic assessment. You don't need a diagnosis in order to get therapy. Okay, so this is a very quick uh, run through of our child development center. I'm just going to change tech a little bit um, on a slightly lighter note. Um, this is our CDC, and we'd like to you know, say thank you very much to Merck and Duryan Berhad, as well as University of Malaya alumni, the class of 1981-86. They generously donated in order to start the CDC. So Merck um, uh, donated to us in 2018, and then the UM alumni in 2019. And I'd like to thank Prof Yazid again, because um, if not for Prof Yazid's efforts, we would not have been able to get these donations and we would not have been able to start the CDC. Okay, so with all these donations, we managed to get the developmental kits and the tools for assessments. Because a lot of the assessments in uh, developmental pediatrics are standardized and that's, they're standardized for a good reason, but it means that you, you know, unfortunately it, it takes money to get these things. And they also have patents, so you can't, you know, you can't just come up with your own kit kind of thing. Um, so these sorts of things um, require funding. And because they managed to fund us, we are able to provide services. Um, also, indirectly, they've helped with the training because um, if we didn't have a center, we wouldn't be able to have training. So this is just the entrance to our CDC. The waiting area and again we're fortunate that we our waiting area is away from the general pediatric clinic because some of our patients get a bit distressed by the noise and the you know the, the confusion there um, and then these are the rooms so room 21 is our largest room where we do most of the standardized assessments that need to be uninterrupted but we do use these other clinic rooms um, just to to clarify we share this clinic space with other clinics so it's not a designated area but um, we, these are the ones that we use for our clinics. And this is just the patient information area, some information that we have there for families while they're waiting. This is the largest room. Um, and then there's a little chair, uh, table with chairs. Okay. okay, so just to summarize, uh, basically moving forward, what we have a lot of things now due to you know, generosity from people who have donated, but um, what we hope to have, we really need human resource. So now we have tools, we have, uh, we have the things that we need, but we need um, expertise. We need clinical psychologists to do you know, IQ assessments, to do um, 
uh, psychometric assessments. We need educational psychologists to do the educational assessments and to make recommendations for school. Of course, we, we try our best to do some of these things, but there are certain things that you can only do if you have a particular qualification. So some assessments can only be done by specialized people, just like some assessments can only be done by developmental pediatricians. So everyone has a different role. Um, and with speech therapists, there are never ever enough speech therapists. So we know that that's a chronic shortage. Um, so you know that's something that we really, it's really, really on our wish list as well. We're very uh, lucky that the occupational therapists at UMMC have been coming regularly for our clinics. So they, they see patients with us and that really helps because I think um, personally, I feel I learn every time they come and I hope that they feel the same way too. But I think it really adds to quality of services to have different points of view. So in a way, it's not quite transdisciplinary. It's sort of multidisciplinary on the way to that. Um, we also need a dedicated area or a designated area to expand services because currently we're sharing space which of course we know, you know, that's that's the way things are because of limited resources. But ideally, we should have a dedicated area because then we can do more. Um, so um, I'm just mentioning this because I think if um, if anyone is interested in getting in touch to do either research or to try to work together, um, particularly if you have these three expertise, uh, please um, contact us uh, because it really will help with patient care in the future. Uh, thank you once again to patients and families. And um, that's my email. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, you very much, Dr. Suba, yeah, for sharing some of the insights on the efforts that your, you and your team done to address like, the importance of developmental disorders on some of the approaches like via international research networks to try to adapt tools developed by the Asian populations to suit into our local culture settings, as well as uh, setting up the CDC clinic just now, uh, the child developmental centers, as well as a sustainable peer mentorship in the field to try to offer targeted services to children struggling with developmental issues, learning issues in a relatively safe space. Yeah, so we do have a few questions posted in the Q&A box, but uh, we will attend to that after Miss Desiree's talk. So we hope Dr. Suba will stay with us till then. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suba. And next, we shall welcome our next speaker of the day, Miss Desiree. So Miss Desiree's passion to advocate all abilities was actually ignited in 20, 2017, when her son, Hans, was diagnosed with autism. So at that moment of time, she could not accept the challenge in obtaining information to help her family. Hence, she decided to empower herself with knowledge. And along the journey, she found out that the most useful information actually comes from people on a similar journeys, be it fellow parents, caregivers, self-advocates, or practitioners. So in 2019, the Project Hans was founded by Ms. Desiree, kicking off with an awareness event which garnered media, media attention. And since then, its social media accounts remain very active and a website was, has been just launched three months ago on July 2021. So I shall now pass the floor to Ms. Desiri to de deliver her talk on Autism is not a puzzle to be solved. So thank you. Please, yeah. Thank you, um, Dr. O, and thank you so much to the Faculty of Medicine for inviting me for this um, to join the e-carnival. Uh, in fact, today is actually World Occupational Therapy Day, so I'd like to wish all occupational therapists out there happy OT day, um, especially my son Hans, therapist who's been with us for four years, uh, teacher Ayuni, um, she knows how much we love her. Um, so yeah, today... Um, I'll be talking from my perspective, the best perspective I can offer, which is as a mom. Um, so good morning, everyone, um, esteemed professors, doctors, and representatives of UM Faculty of Medicine, and all the uh, attendees of the Research E-Carnival today. My name is Desri. I'm a mother to a six-year-old boy named Hans, and he's the inspiration behind Project Hans' little initiative, which I kicked off in April 2019. Our journey into the world of neurodiversity began in August of 2017 when Hans was officially diagnosed with autism by Dr. Subashini herself 
who was just speaking earlier, and um, I can attest to the fact of how the clinic in um, UMMC has really grown since 2017. I believe it was just Dr. Subhashini seeing all the patients, and now when we go, there's at least four or five um, doctors there. Um, so yeah, the signs were very clear in, in my son Hans. I noticed his delayed milestones in speech and his fascination with water bottles. Um, he enjoyed spinning in circles, flapping his hands while jumping up and down. At the same time, he also enjoyed car rides, uh, but became very restless and upset in unfamiliar um, faces. So outings were very challenging for us in the early days. Um, all these prompted us to seek an early diagnosis for Hans. Um, so he displayed what um, is known as the autism triad, um, challenges in social communication, social interaction, and repetitive behaviors. And um, I will say we were pretty blessed to navigate the system and actually get an appointment in UMMC in less than six months. So Hans was actually diagnosed by the time he had just turned two. Um, and for this, I'll always be grateful to UMMC. Um, so when Dr. Subhashini uttered the words autism and that it is a spectrum of three levels, um, Hans was um, diagnosed at level two. So he had um, speech delay challenges with social and communication skills. Um, denial was the furthest thing from our minds. And when I say our, I mean my husband and I. From the day Hans was born, we poured love into our miracle child. So when autism was thrown into the mix for us first-time parents, um, the thing I spiraled into was actually anger. Anger not with Hans, not with the diagnosis, but because I didn't know enough about autism. And so what happened was I started having a bit of an information overload. Um, there was so much information online and I didn't know how scary Google could be. Um, so much information, but nothing that was really... Um, you know, particular to our situation. So I did not know where to begin. Um, support wasn't easily available to us either. And, you know, we basically started from scratch. So I started visiting centers and got even angrier because the price tags on therapy and interventions privately was just so expensive. And I started um, getting sick. So I had frequent tummy aches, which I assume was gastric. And when I visited a GP near my home, um, she asked me if I was stressed and I mentioned, you know, looking for centers for my autistic child. And she was very quick to blame me for causing my son's autism. She said it was because I ate whatever I wanted when I was pregnant. Um, and that's why my son is autistic. And she insisted autism didn't exist decades ago because people ate healthier food. And then she went on to tell me that I need to feed my son less and make him thin because it's just better for autistic kids when they're thinner. So when I heard this, of course, I was a little bit sad at first because, you know, it's coming from a doctor. But then the rage within me burned even, even hotter and to a crisp this time. And uh, I couldn't accept that I didn't know enough to tell that doctor how wrong she was. Also, the cause of autism did not matter to me and nor does it today because all I know is I love my son and I want to be able to support him in whatever he needs to live, to live his best life to his best potential. So that's when I decided to arm myself with knowledge. Um, so I've since completed my master's in special education from UKM. Um, I attended the Sunrise Program, which is an approach for individuals with autism that is very play and love based. And most recently, I completed handed more than words parent training. I've also had the privilege of befriending autistic adults in the UK, US, and here in Malaysia who were diagnosed late, and they gave me some of the best insights and coping strategies for autistics. Um, but at the same time, it is not the same for everyone. Um, realizing the power of information and how it helped me navigate my journey with my son is what uh, prompted me to initiate Project Hunts. So first in an event, in 2019, consisting of talks by parents, a job coach, and university lecturers. Um, however, you know, just after that, I, I wanted to do an event a year later, but the pandemic hit, so uh, physical events just not feasible, which is what uh, prompted me to then uh, start out a website, which has a list of services here in Malaysia. I realized that a lot of parent support groups have their own lists of services and places to go but there is no one place um, 
for us to get all the information. So I'm trying my best to build that database on Project Han's website. And also there's a section called Spectrum of Voices, um, which uh, consists of articles that I write myself or contributed by anyone who's touched by neurodiversity. Um, so right about now, I'm sure you're wondering what does my topic, autism is not a puzzle to be solved, have to do with what I just told you. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you about it now. The puzzle piece has actually represented autism and its advocacy for the longest time. I did not know the significance nor the meaning. However, most recently, in fact, only this year did I come to understand that not all, um, not all, but some adults who are autistic find the puzzle piece a bit offensive. So a little bit of background, the puzzle piece actually came about in 1963 when the National Autistic Society of London used it for the first time, representing a very puzzling condition called autism, which had parents stumped. The puzzle logo was used alongside a crying child and was said to be apt at representing a puzzling condition that children were handicapped with. And the weeping child alongside it was reminding um, of how autistic people suffer from their handicap. And I'd just like to highlight here that these are just words. I know some of these words are um, offensive to some. I'm not using them in any derogatory manner. It's just I've lifted it from various articles online to just explain the history behind the puzzle piece. Um, so over the years, the puzzle piece was actually adopted by Autism Speaks in the US with many media campaigns using the puzzle. Um, autism Speaks as well has generated a lot of controversy over the years, you know, viewing autism as a disease, overemphasizing on ABA, which, um, which is applied behavioral analysis, a very widely researched form of therapy for autism, which is also quite controversial because now uh, autistic adults are relating their childhood memories of how traumatizing ABA was. So now let me emphasize, I'm not here to dispute any form of therapy and practices. I'm a big fan of anything that helps our children. I have much respect for therapists, doctors, and professionals in the fields. I'm merely, merely relating those varying perspectives I have come across on my journey. So the puzzle piece had become a symbol for autism, connoting it as a puzzle, puzzling condition, and resulting in self-advocates now speaking up and saying they are not a puzzle that needs to be solved. Just because they view the world differently does not make them puzzling. So here are some, uh, I did a mini survey among some of the people I know. Um, these are all um, autistic adults. And this, this is what they say about the puzzle piece. Um, my friend Carly in the UK says, we do not need fixing, nor are we missing a piece to the puzzle. It is connected with Autism Speaks, which is a charity that doesn't support autism in a correct manner. Uh, my friend B says that awareness and association of it, uh, it with Autism Speak, who ran a multi-platform campaign depicting autistics as diseased folk and that autistics are a burden. And also she says she's not incomplete um, and um, not a puzzle piece either, right? Um, and, you know, and these are just some of the views from actually autistic adults with reference to the, to the puzzle piece. So my point for sharing this is um, just to get a conversation going on why are we still using the, the puzzle piece, right? Granted, there are some who are of the opinion that the symbol doesn't matter, it's the cause that matters, which is a very valid point in argument. There are also some who are pushing for a different symbol, which is um, the rainbow infinity. This is traced back to Autistic Pride Day in 2005, which is celebrated on 18 June. And the rainbow infinity represents the diversity of individuals with autism and the endless opportunities and differences within the autistic community. And now having said this, there are some also who say that the rainbow colors of the infinity symbol, um, that rainbow colors actually represent the LGBTQIA plus community. So there are many conversations um, going about the symbols that represent autism. However, personally, from my perspective, I don't think this conversation has reached our shores here in Malaysia, which is why I'm bringing it up here today. Um, so in conclusion, I would like to share with you why I don't think that autism is a puzzle to be solved, right? So autism is not a puzzle. A puzzle is a puzzle with an end goal and an aim. Once you solve a puzzle, it is complete and perhaps move on to a different one. Autism in a person is not meant to be solved. It is something the individual will carry on with for life. So it is not about 
solving um, or as my friend Nicole Gosling from from Clubhouse once said to her her daughter's therapist she said I do not need my daughter to be less autistic autism is not a puzzle because it is a different way of processing the world just because something is different than the norm does not mean it needs fixing or solving or saving how about making the accommodations to include everyone regardless how they process the world Autism is not a puzzle because when I look at my son, I don't see him as a project to solve or to make sense of. I see so much love, joy, and love in him. And yes, I said the word love twice. Um, as many say, it is puzzling. But has anyone ever made a logo to represent love as a puzzle to solve? I have yet to come across any. And autism is not a puzzle because autism is a difference of neurology and does not mean a person is incomplete. Everyone is complete in their own way. Perhaps some communicate by talking, some may use sign language, and some may use assistive communication technology. Just because someone communicates differently and we may not understand does not make them a puzzle to solve. So how about looking at it as something to understand? How about learning to communicate in a way the neurodivergent person understands? In fact, we do it all the time in the way we speak to different people differently. We speak to our bosses differently, our spouses and our parents differently. Yet we do not call that a puzzle to solve. So how about we take the time to understand and accept differences? Um, I would like to really thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity to share my views here today. And especially thank you to Dr. Subashini for putting my name forth to the organizers. I would say my one of my final messages today you know, is if we're going to use symbols to represent a cause and advocate for something, let us truly understand why we are using it and not just use it because it's been used all along. Um, and also, you know, I just want to quickly uh, commend Dr. Subhashini and UMSC's effort in um, all the research that Dr. Subhashini just presented. Um, um, I think I need to read a little bit more on um, academic uh, or academic journals and all that, uh, which I've neglected recently, been reading a lot of other advocacy blogs and posts. Uh, I think it's great that UMMC, UMMC is doing so much for, for our children. And um, with that, I will hand this session back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Desir uh, Mr. Ms. Desiris, for actually sharing your journeys and valuable experience with us. I think it's really interesting that we actually see this from the parents' point of view. And I actually like the, the tagline that you mentioned just now that um, for you, like autism is not a project to solve. It's not a puzzle to be solved, but you see love and care and concern for your kids. And it's really great that you actually established this project. Hans, and I think this is a very good platform for children or young people with all these developmental disabilities, autisms or learning disabilities to have a sense of belonging not just for the patients, but also for the rest of the family. Yep. So uh, we do have quite a number of questions in the Q&A box. So yeah, uh, so there's one question. Uh, it says that uh, the findings are actually really impressive. So just wondering, how do you share it with your parents? And how do you share it? I guess this is for uh, Dr. Suba. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so. Admittedly, that's something that we have to work on because generally we um, we get informed consent, we explain to families, we you know get them to participate if they consent, and then of course if we you know if we are successful, we manage to publish uh, what we have. But um, the thing about some of the journals is that they're not open access, so we can't really openly distribute the articles to everyone. We can't even do that with colleagues. Because for some journals, you need to you know, subscribe or get access to, to read these things. So because of that, um, we're a little bit limited in distribution of that information. But I suppose one thing we can do is later on, maybe um, if, we, uh, if we add that as part of the methodology that we will share the results with families, then we may be able to do that without um, you know, violating these sorts of uh, you know, a confidentiality things. Um, but yes, I think that that is an important thing. And that's probably more with the patient and public involvement that is, you know, the theme of the carnival has been. So I think it's a learning journey for all of us as well. Yes. Right. Thank you, Dr. Subha. 
And there's another question that says, uh, in your opinion, what are the gaps that you identify in providing services to these children? So I guess just now you mentioned about the establishment of CDC clinics. So I guess uh, besides needing more professionals, like you mentioned, like speech therapists, education specialists, or developmental pediatricians, is there any gaps which you will see or you identify in providing services to these children in our countries? Um, I think um, the main thing is that, you know, I, I feel people don't really realize the importance of it. Um, it's a new specialty here, but it's been established in places like the US, uh, Australia, um, even UK to some extent for quite a long time. So I, I think um, it hasn't, and even New Zealand, I think people haven't come to that realization yet. Maybe the public has, and I'm sure families and, you know, the general public and you know, relatives of patients and all that definitely have. But I think as a, an overall system, we have to recognize that. And until and unless we have that, we're not going to, to be able to address these gaps. So that's the main thing. The second thing, of course, is, you know, it sounds terrible to talk about, but it's basically funding. Um, so not so much, funding for research is one aspect. Uh, it's a big aspect, but I think funding for services is an even bigger one. Um, and it has to be sustainable funding. So just getting a lot of funding at one go is not going to be, you need running costs, you need things over time. So that, that takes a bit of commitment. And I think um, unless things are allocated that way, we're not really going to be, addressed, be able to address these big gaps. Um, also, the third thing is that we need to ensure that you know, uh, medical officers, pediatricians are a little bit uh, more um, aware and that, you know, like when, when I heard what Desiree said about, you know, when she saw a GP, I, I, I think that's a bit unusual. Um, I hope it's unusual. But when I think about it, it may not be, I, you know, sometimes people have a lot of misconceptions. And when healthcare professionals are the ones perpetuating these misconceptions, it really adds to the problem. Um, but I think um, Desiree will probably be in a better position to tell you what families need so if, if she's okay to to you know, answer this as well maybe she can add thanks uh sure so in terms of providing services right there was a question providing services to children uh, i think you address most of it dr subashini another thing is i think affordability um, so while, you know, there's a lot of free services for our children with special needs in the government sector, like you highlighted just now, there's also a shortage, right? Mm -hmm. um, can't get the frequency that we need in the government sector. And, you know, I really applaud the government hospitals for just trying their best. But, you know, we also, as parents, we also have to acknowledge that, you know, you can't do, the government sector can't do everything. But on the other hand, when you look at the private sector, it's just very costly, Right. So even for me, a middle income family, we work harder for that income to afford the therapies that are my child needs. Right. So the other thing that I would usually tell parents is, you know, go out there and try to empower yourself with information. Um, talk to other people, learn tips and tricks. Some of the parent trainings are affordable, some are not. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, information is, is power. Um, I think support groups as well, the online support groups, parent support groups are also very helpful because... Um, especially with our special needs children, also realizing that it's not one size fits all, right? So when we go to a general website, we get very generic information about autism or ADHD, but all our children are different. Yeah. Thank you both Dr. Suba and Ms. Desiree. So, uh, yeah, I think like, I totally agree. Uh, I actually, uh, last time I had this encounter to this uh, autism centers I paid a visit and realized that there is actually a very different group of um, kids that whereby there are some groups which are very quiet and keeping to themselves and there are actually another group which are very actively. So yes, uh, so I'm just wondering, uh, just questions for Miss Desiree is that in your opinion, is that how, on, in your experience, what are the stigma by the communities? And how acceptive are the publics or sometimes the parents towards uh, special education needs? Um, I would say a lot of the, I think my experience so far, we've been quite blessed. So we have not really gotten sort of, you know, extremely negative stigmatized comments. You know, in back in the day, you'd still hear words like 
handicapped or you know the Malay word cacat and all that. I've not encountered that uh, in my experience. Um, now what I find is the misconceptions is just that the understanding of what autism is. Um, there are many misconceptions, like the one that I mentioned earlier about the doctor telling me one is my fault. The other misconception that it's caused by the vaccines, which we all know it's not. Uh, and the other thing also, which is always perpetuated by Hollywood, right? That if someone is autistic, they must be savant. They must be genius, right? Or then there's the other end of the spectrum. Okay, so if they're not a genius, then they must have very low IQ, which is not really the case because autism is the spectrum, right? So I would say the main stigma now within the community is not really a stigma it's more the misconceptions and the understanding of what autism really is and i would say it's not just for autism i would say it's generally for all neurodivergent uh, conditions so kids with adhd are often stigmatized as being naughty and hypo or rude which they are not right if their, their brains function differently yeah uh, sorry there was another question with that right you said about special education Yes, how accepted they are, the parents, the publics. How uh, you mean parents with neurodivergent children? Yes. Or yes. Um it's I would say it's different with every parent. There are some who would prefer children being in a mainstream school for inclusion. And there are some who would prefer specialized um special needs schools. So like I said, it's not one size fits all, just like how all kids are different. Parents' preferences are different too. Like so in my case. Although Hans is meant to go to standard one next year, um, we've just done our review with uh, UMSC uh, last, last week, in fact. And so we've got the deferment letter not to send him to the government school um, in standard one because he's still not doing so well with speech. He has a couple of words, uh, you know, and developmentally, I, just, I personally just don't think he's ready for a setting. So for me, my preference would be to follow the lead of my child when he's ready. To me, it doesn't matter. He could be 12 years old and doing standard one work and it just, it wouldn't matter to me as long as he's happy and healthy. So it, it really depends on the parent and the child's preference. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atsuri. And yeah, I'm actually quite, um, was actually surprised as well when you mentioned about your experience that the GP actually mentioned uh, what kind of misconception that the GP actually relayed convey on and yeah probably one of these questions for Dr. Suba is that what could be the reason or the risk factors for the developmental issues based on what we understand right now okay um I think that's it's an important question but it's not one I can answer in two minutes um there are lots of risk factors some that we know some that we don't know um, all we really do know is that with developmental conditions, it's multifactorial, which means that there's more than one reason for all of it. So genetics can play a part, um, but when I say genetics, it doesn't necessarily mean heritable factors. It can be just genetics in the child. Um, it can also be environmental factors, but the... The thing is, it's so it's such a wide range of disorders or conditions. I think I prefer the word conditions rather than disorders, but there's a wide range um, and lumping them all together is difficult. So if um, you, know, you, you could have autism spectrum disorder and be considered to have a developmental condition, you could have attention deficit hyperactivity and also you know, that would also be considered a developmental condition. Um, speech delay, you know, global development delay, all of that comes under, uh, you know, developmental conditions. It's a very big umbrella, including genetic conditions like trisomy 21 and all of that. So it's hard to say all the, the risk factors, but what we do know is that, um, it, you know, it, it's not something that can be easily explained straight away. Um, for different conditions, there are different risk factors. Um, and, you know, some of it are within our control. Um, not so much in terms of, you know, uh, avoiding. So I think that's something that people have to remember that, you know, it's not something that you can say, do this or don't do that, and then you won't get, it's not, it's not like that. It's not cause and effect. But when I say it's within our control, it's more in terms of modifying the difficulties with function. That's something which therapy can help later on. So that will help, but it doesn't affect causation. Um, I hope that that clarifies that. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Dr. Suba. And there is a question from Cher, is that uh, how can parents with autistic children be more prepared and get educated? 
So as you say, the information can be overwhelming and scary. Is there any support from the KKM? Okay, so I, uh, I mean, I'm from the university background, so I can't really speak for, you know, all the services there are in KKM. But um, if you look at, you know, public services, generally speaking, you're supposed to be able to get some level of support and counselling at the time of diagnosis when you see the doctor. Um, and you're also supposed to get some level of information there. In terms of websites, there is a local website, which is done by the Genius Kunia Group, previously known as Promata Kunia. So they have some information in, in DM, um, and that helps, you know, that provides information for parents. Um, in terms of like, you know, organized workshops and things like that for parents, I don't know of any other public organization that has done it, but of course, NGOs do run those sorts of things. Uh, with websites, like for us, what we do is <clears throat> today we reference websites in our clinic, free websites for parents, but unfortunately, all those websites are in English. Um, so sometimes I just say, okay, let's Google Translate. And, you know, generally when you translate, if it's English to BM, you can still, you know, work it out. But if you Google Translate to other languages, I think a lot gets lost in translation. So that is a big gap. And that's something that would be good to work on. But um, I think we have to do that as a big group in order to make it sustainable because managing a website is difficult. Um, I don't know how Desiree does it, but I think the parent groups have started up their own system and they are you know, they're very passionate about it and they're very committed. And I think the parents should look to other parents and families for information because a lot of it, when we give information, we, we, we have a limited period of time. Um, so that we try to give the most important information at that point. And we try to answer questions and use that consultation time more to answer questions in real time. But often I'm sure when parents go back, it's only once they go back and you know the, they sort of realize what was discussed that they have a lot of questions. So that's where the support groups come in. Right, okay. But thank you, Dr. Sabah. So I think, yeah, time is running up. We shall move on to the second session. So once again, thank you, Dr. Subashini and Ms. Desiree for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So following that, we are fortunate to have Prof. Azrianti from the Department of Pediatric, as well as Ms. Narisa Hakim Aslan and Mr. Muhammad Faris Naim to share their expertise and experience in tackling obesity metabolic syndrome in children and adolescents. So a bit of background, Associate Professor Asriandi earned her MBBS and Master of Pediatrics from University of Malaya. So in year 2015, she was awarded as a Certified Pediatric Endocrinologist by the National Specialist Register. So Associate Prof Asriandi is currently a Consultant Pediatric Endocrinologist and a unit head in UMMC, in which she specializes in endocrine and diabetes management in children. Her passion is towards patient care and education, as well as aiming to increase awareness on pediatric diabetes amongst not just the healthcare professions, as well as the public in general. So in no times, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Associate Professor Asriyanti to educate us on metabolic syndromes and obesity in children and adolescents. Right. Thank you so much, Lizian. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, a short one would really do. I, I'm not you know, really impressive. I'm still um, learning throughout my way as well. Um, shall I share my slide first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, excellent. And uh, you can hear me loud and clear. I'm yes. in my clinic, so it's a little bit noisy at the back. Okay. Now, Right, thank you so much, Lizian. I was given a task today, this morning, to talk about metabolic syndrome in children. So it's been quite some time since I last talked about uh, obesity and metabolic syndrome. Well, I think it's due in time. And um, um, I think what we need to do is uh, to look into this matter again. Um, there's a lot of issues in children with obesity. So literally, my talk will be mainly about obesity in children. I'm going to do something about it. And also, uh, since this is a re -e, um, carnival for research, I think it's a good time for me to be able to um, connect to all of you today, whoever you are in the program today, uh, for potential research opportunities in the um, uh, near future. Okay, let's see. Right, so when we talk about metabolic syndrome, well, in children, it's a little bit more limited and it's not as generalized 
as the adult definition of metabolic syndrome. So, um, you know, there's lots of papers looking at metabolic syndrome in children. There's a lot of other classifications as well. If I'm mistaken, I think there are about 11 or 12 papers looking at uh, trying to reclassify metabolic syndrome in children. But I think at the moment, it stands quite um, solid uh, to follow the IDF uh, classification of um, metabolic in syndrome, uh, syndrome in children, uh, by which, you know, when the child has um, some sort of like risk factors before the age of 10, we don't quite call them with um, having a metabolic syndrome. However, if they're between 10 to uh, 16, let me use my laser pointer here, between 10 to 16 years old, then we can perhaps, um, you know, label them with having metabolic syndrome and above 16 to use the same criteria of IDF uh, criteria for adult metabolic syndrome. So what we are looking at is central obesity. So you need a child need to have obesity. Uh, plus any of the other um, uh, risk factors, like for example, the uh, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, blood pressure, or any uh, risk of impaired fasting glucose to be, for them to be able to be labeled as metabolic syndrome. Okay, so it is quite complex. It sounds quite advanced. It qu sounds quite uh, adulty, but um, uh, bearing in mind, we are seeing a rise in this um, problem here in children. Well, I think we started right back in 2008, okay, when I first, um, um, when I was doing my master's of thesis, I was interested looking at these uh, overweight and obese children. At that point of time, you're also seeing an increment of um, obesity children, overweight and obesity children were referred to our clinic with uh, Professor Fatima and Professor Yazid at that point of time. And I had a group of children uh, looking at um, uh, obese and overweight children and looking at their um, prevalence of metabolic syndrome in this group. And it is clearly quite high, one in every four children who are obese and overweight at that point of time in our clinic. So bearing in mind, this is a very small group, looking at small group are already having uh, metabolic syndrome. Uh, we went on to do another, again, a specialized based study back in 2011 with our uh, medical student, very enthusiastic medical students. And again, we are seeing almost similar number, one in every for children having metabolic syndrome. And what I would like to share with you at that point of time, we are also seeing an increment of children who are obese and you can see their weight circumference, waist circumference at that point of time, both for the female and male children are way above the adult cutoff point. So this is just to, to have some idea on how severe the condition back then in 2011. Uh, subsequently, the Malaysian um, group from the, uh, headed by the UKM team, Prof. B. Kwan, uh, Professor Poh uh, B, um, uh, continued to have uh, and, and uh, sort of like collected more bigger data, national data, and we have actually have our own with circumference charge, which I will be sharing with you a bit later. Okay, moving forward, um, there are a lot more papers coming up um, after that. So back in 2011, um, uh, uh, and looking at children in Kuala Lumpur, looking at the school children in Kuala Lumpur in 2011, uh, Prof. Awang Bugiba and Professor B again looking at children, um, 402 children comparing the normal weight and the obese children. And they have found in that population outside in normal school children without symptoms, they are about 5.3% already being diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. So that's a bit odd, isn't it? They are asymptomatic and yet 5% of them already having metabolic syndrome, not seen in the hospital base. In 2011 as well, another group from uh, Dr. Professor Narayanan, also looking at the obese and overweight children, and again, at this group, because they are looking particularly at the over overweight and obese children, one in every three of them, okay, almost similar to what we are seeing in the uh, hospital base, are uh, overweight and they have metabolic syndrome in that particular school that they were looking at, the randomized school that they were looking at. 2015, this one is, was done in 2015. We had a good, um, what do you call that, uh, a research grant to look into some of these adolescents, a 13-year-old adolescents in Petaling Jaya. Again, uh, we were um, surprised to see 21% of them in this overweight and obese children uh, having metabolic syndrome in this, in this cohort of uh, children that we are looking at back in 2015. 
Um, in 2014, just uh, one year prior to the uh, previous uh, paper, um, we uh, a group, Professor Yazid's group, um, together with one of our colleague, uh, Dr. Fazlina, uh, proceeded with another um, cohort uh, with the My Heart study, with the uh, quite a big group of uh, children looking at a cohort children uh, of a 13 year old children uh, back up slightly up north, Kuala Lumpur, Pera, and also uh, Kedah area, looking at children, a huge cohort group of children. And this one combined. Combi Combining both uh, um, both adult uh, sorry obese as well as non obese children, they have found about two point six percent, nearly three percent of children without any symptoms having metabolic syndrome. Um, we did another study. Uh, this one is a comp uh, just hospital based, looking at the first visit of uh, children who presented to our clinic in 2016, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Noazlina and uh, Professor Yazid uh, managed to look into all the children who was referred to our clinic at first visit. And we have found, not surprising to see, one in every um, uh, four children uh, already metabolic syndrome upon first clinic visit at presentation. Okay, so what is it that I'm trying to highlight here? What I'm trying to say is that metabolic syndrome is around, I mean, we are probably uh, already looking out for it. Uh, whether is it getting more attention? Are we getting are we are we getting more awareness in this? Um, I, I really do hope so because you know the risk factors and the uh, consequences of children with metabolic syndrome are quite overwhelming. So when we talk about the, the um, risk factors for metabolic syndrome, let me just remind all of you again that uh, the main issue here is overweight and obesity in children. Okay, so metabolic syndrome is um, an indicator or a risk which is slightly above obesity. So the, new, uh, the normal or what we call the uh, nutritional obesity or the non-complicated obesity is the first path or the first um, category of going towards uh, more problem. And then we have metabolic syndrome where they have slightly higher risk with lots of, uh, with some complications that's already set in from that obesity itself and eventually the end uh, target point and, and organ damage, which is the type 2 diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular diseases, which we will discuss a bit later. So when we talk about risk factors, so before having obesity, what are the things that, that we need to consider to look at what are the potential issues that we can actually prevent or maybe we can uh, consider to, to, prevent, uh, to prevent our children to become more overweight or obesity. So those are the lists. We have genes. We know that parents who are obese can, um, you know, stimulate, or children who are obese are actually having parents who are obese, okay? Birth weight is uh, strongly associated, breastfeeding, growth, social economy, diet, and of course, physical activity. Okay, why are we worried? Because we know that children with uh, obesity uh, now is taking up, you know, um, soaring up high, Malaysia bullying, well, we, can, we can say that, yeah. So we are seeing that adults, one in every three adults are now obese here in Malaysia, and up to 16%, uh, 12% of our children are getting obese. And one in every five of our Malaysian children is either overweight or obese. So this was back up reported in 2013, 2015. And um, in the recent um, uh, you know, UNICEF report, I know rem I remember, I mean, I've had to literally, um, what do you call that? Um, in uh, um, uh, talking about both stunting, problem with stunting and undernutrition in Malaysia, which I believe Professor Lucy has mentioned uh, to the uh, team yesterday, to the uh, similar platform yesterday uh, in the afternoon. And I have, I'm also in charge of the obesity, um, you know, children, uh, concern of the obesity children in children. And you can see that despite being also stunted and wasted, the UNICEF uh, reports in 2017 also is showing Malaysia is one of the top 10 uh, children who are overweight and obese in 2017. So, mm, so we are dealing in two different spectrum here and it is not easy, okay? Uh, like I've mentioned earlier on, uh, Professor Po Bi Kwan uh, has actually looking at, uh, had, had actually collected a lot of numbers um, in the national survey to look at the, our, our waste circumference. And I'm happy to show all of you that in Malaysia, our children actually have our own waste circumference chart, which is fantastic, really. We don't have uh, the national height and weight chart, but we have a Malaysian uh, children waist circumference chart, because as you can see here, um, sorry, I think this one is a girl and this is a boy uh, chart. You can see that our either girls or boy chart, you can see we are way soaring up high 
as compared to our uh, adolescent in the Caucasian area, Turkey, British, Australia, and Hong Kong. So what I'm trying to say is that the metabolic component in our Asian population is so overwhelming that if you have a child or even ourselves, okay, like for example, for myself, you have the same BMI with my counterpart in the Caucasian uh, country, same BMI, same height, same weight, we as our uh, we have our genetic Asian genetic potential. We are actually higher at a higher risk, three times higher risk of getting metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, and cardiovascular complication as compared to our counterpart. So this is one of the evidence uh, to show you that you know um, the event starts right from the very beginning, starts from the very young. Okay, next one. Okay, so let's just go back quickly to the risk factor. So we know the incidence, the prevalence of obesity is, is, is very high in Malaysia. Okay, um, so what are the risk factors? I've shown you a few lists just now. We know genetics can cause obesity. We know children who are born small or too large is also associated with obesity. Um, you know that um, uh, babies who are born small, although they are well and, and um, there's no other issues, they, they are at risk of either stunting or they can also at risk of being fed a little bit too much very early on and become um, obese later on in life. We know uh, babies are um, um, sort of like engineered or, or um, the genetics have been sort of like predetermined right from the uh, maternal pre-pregnancy. Even the mother, mother's mother, so meaning our grandmother uh, risk is already being written, genetic has been written, and what we are now affects our second generation and third generation later in the future. So mothers who are obese, mothers with history of GDM are also a good um, sort of like a predisposing factors toward childhood obesity and metabolic syndrome in long run. Breastfeeding, we know we, that's why we try as pediatrician, we want our children to be breastfed as much as possible. We try to reduce the um, um, use of a very high protein content in infant formula in normal children, normal babies. Um, our children love sweetened beverages, okay, right from when they are young up to their teenagers, they love to drink a lot of sweetened beverages. So in 2017, a lovely um, uh, research, the National Health Service uh, research is showing that uh, the uh, consumption of carbonated drinks are vast in our country and the highest is noted in Sarawak as well as Sabah taking up to 60 70 percent of daily um, sweetened beverages and you can imagine all of this uh, eventually will um, you know um, uh, lead to childhood obesity uh, you know behavior food behavior we know that children who skip meals who skip breakfast tends to have uh, tend to become obese and uh, not having a proper meal time also plays a huge impact. Uh, we know our Malaysian food is very high dense um, in terms of our carbohydrate and refined fats. And uh, there are many studies looking at the my heart group, my BFF group, as well as my um, uh, current study that I'm doing a, a, a collaboration together with the uh, UPM team, um, the adult study, also looking at the relationship. So the difference between my heart study is doing slightly um, the northern part of um, Malaysia and the uh, adult study is doing the Greece, Milan, Kelantan and Johor, looking at the um, relationship between their dietary pattern and the, the results are consistent. So our children love high carbs, high fat diet, hence why we are getting more and more children who are obese and eventually metabolic syndrome sets in. Apart from that, we know screen time and sedentary behavior is also a big, big, big factor. Uh, I mean, you can see nowadays if you go even, you know, during even the COVID time is even worse when you go to out when, you know, now that we are allowing out and dine in and you can see children uh, literally eating while looking at the uh, phones that is as young as one years old, two years old babies who are actually dining in with parents in, in the shop. And you can imagine at home, they'll be fed while watching television. So these are all unhealthy behavior that is um, uh, becoming a risk factor towards this childhood obesity. We know that children, um, the NHMS 2017 is showing six in out of seven children are active internet users, which is not, um, you know, this was even done prior to uh, COVID time. So I'm pretty sure now seven in seven are all internet active users and two out of seven are already addicted to internet. This is way before pre-COVID time. 
And clearly our children are limited in terms of doing physical activities. During MCO has hit us quite hard and most children are being kept at home. And we've had an increment of uh, children who were um, you know, not even referred to us for obesity, but the ones existing patient in our uh, obesity clinic are showing a massive trend or a massive increment in their weight gain in the past six months to 18 months okay so we try to limit them in terms of screening time but you know with COVID it's very difficult to do so it's very challenging sleep the other thing about sleep um, my colleague uh, Prof Yazid as well as Dr Fazlina back in 2014 doing the study looking at the metabolic syndrome in the uh, uh, schools in 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 um, Clan Valley has also looked into a time sleeping time and we have seen that children who sleeps less or excessive sleep, sleep can also cause them to have obesity and um, uh, prevalence, the, their prevalence and their risk factors, uh, risk of getting metabolic syndrome is higher. So they need, children need to sleep because they sleep, when they sleep, their hormones are regulated better, they grow better, and they have uh, um, well uh, balanced hormone when it comes to daytime uh, and also um, uh, other hormonal balance. Right. So um, in terms of because of time, we have, uh, I've got only 30 minutes. I mean, if you want to talk about obesity, it's an hour lecture kind of thing. And there's a lot of things to talk about obesity. There's a lot of collaborative studies actually are doing, I'm, I'm doing together with other teams. Um, but as for now, what we would, I would like to highlight is that the metabolic syndrome in these children with obesity. And like I say, First is the risk factor, next is the simple obesity. Once with complication, we label them with metabolic syndrome. And what we are trying to prevent them to have is the end organ damage, which is number one is the type two diabetes. So uh, we know our children, I mean, in, in well, basic knowledge, Diabetes in children is type one, full stop. That's what we know. That's what I know back 20 years down the line when I was doing my medical school years. Um, but now times are changing. Now environment is changing. And now we're having more and more children with obesity and metabolic syndrome. Hence, the incidence of type two diabetes children is vastly um, you know, uh, going up uh, in trend. And uh, we are getting more and more patients being diagnosed with type two diabetes, okay? And type 2 diabetes is even more difficult to manage and more challenging as compared to type 1 because type 1 we know is just autoimmune insulin, uh, insulin deficiency. But in type 2 diabetes, it's multifactorial. It is genetic, it is uh, insulin resistance, it's hepatic cell failure, it's uh, renal absorption, uh, glucose absorption is abnormal, the uh, incretin effect. So there's a lot more complications in type 2 uh, diabetes. However, in children, we are very limited in terms of treatment. And at the moment, again, back to lifestyle intervention, metformin, and perhaps uh, insulin uh, treatment. So so um, our data of Malaysian uh, children with type 2 diabetes were last seen in 29, 2009 because of data restriction and funds issue. At that point of time, we are seeing already uh, an increment of children with type 2 diabetes. Here in UMMC itself, we are the tertiary referral center for children with diabetes. And you can see that uh, this is the purple line, sorry, probably not going to be seen uh, better, but the one on the top is the type 1 diabetes incidence and the type 2 diabetes newly diabetes diagnosed uh, type 2 diabetes ranging between uh, 5 to 13 cases a year, almost something similar to our type 1 diabetes. So it is actually getting worse. Except for 2020, I believe because of COVID, so we are not getting the right number of amount of referral during that time. But otherwise, you can see the number is increasing along the year. The other endpoint complication is the cardiovascular disease. Um, the one that we've had uh, studies going on and looking at the collaborating studies going on to look at the carotid intimaticness is an indicator towards um, cardiovascular disease in uh, development of cardiovascular disease in young adulthood. Okay, so we are seeing more and more young premature cardiovascular disease happening. I'm sure the adult um, papers are probably uh, agreeing to this. There are more, last time we used to see uh, people after the age of 65 in men and after the age of 55 in ladies having cardiovascular illness or disease diseases, but now the age is getting younger and we are seeing more and more um, children having uh, complications or uh, risk factors to show that they are uh, towards going towards this um, cardiovascular disease uh, on top of their medical um, metabolic syndrome. Okay, 
So um, other collaborating uh, studies that I'm, I'm also involved in is with the uh, Putra Adol study, looking at the uh, children in, um, what do you call that, the um, Negris Milan, Kla, Kla, uh, Melaka, as well as Johor. And we are at the moment looking at this, apart from just looking at the dietary pattern, we are also assessing fatty liver disease, uh, carotid intima thickness to look into the outcome of children with uh, uh, poor uh, children with uh, metabolic syndrome and uh, obesity. We are very concerned about this because we know in statistics in Malaysia in 2017, ischemic heart disease is one of the highest uh, leading cause of death uh, here in Malaysia. And to prevent that, I think we need to prevent right from the very beginning. We need to prevent the risk factors. We need to prevent children with obesity as well. So what can we do about this? Okay, so uh, management of children with uh, childhood obesity is very complex. I acknowledge Dr. Subashini and uh, Mrs. Dashery just now talking about autism, how complex it is, how difficult it is to, to, to uh, uh, manage children with autism. Something similar with childhood obesity. It is so much difficult as what I can, you know, things that we can do in clinic, uh, things we can do, um, um, you know, in papers and trying to increase awareness about childhood obesity. Uh, there, it's, it's not getting a serious attention, okay? But what we can do from our side, I think the most important things what we can do and highlight is to recognize obesity is a disease. I remembered um, last time we used to say, uh, especially among some ethnicity, which thinks that childhood obesity is prosperous. The more chubby your children are, the more prosperous your family is, you see? Uh, but we have to, got to change that perception. We know that childhood obesity is a disease and the disease, the recognition is very important for early referral and early intervention, okay? There's no magic drug, there's no magic treatment. I wish I can give, uh, you know, some kind of pill to help these children, even maybe, you know, adults as well, but uh, there's no such thing as that. What we can do here in our center, being the tertiary center for childhood obesity clinic, I have to acknowledge that our, our hospital has one of the first uh, few hospitals um, uh, in Malaysia that has our own dedicated childhood obesity started off way back in 2010, 2009 by Professor Yazid. Okay, we set up because we saw this increment, this need of childhood obesity clinic. And I believe also my colleague in UKM, Dr. Joyce Hong, is also um, having uh, now a dedicated um, childhood obesity clinic. Uh, there's only uh, a few centers here in Malaysia with pediatric endocrine. Uh, specialty and only these two centers at the moment is running childhood obesity clinic. So at, at this point of time, I have to say that we are not a weight loss center. I don't have a weight loss program to help these children to lose weight. What I can do is that we can start screening. We screen for complication, we skin, screen for com, um, uh, diseases, and we try to identify what are the risk, modifiable risk factors that we can do to help these children and their parents, okay? We, I have a dedicated uh, pediatric, um, what do you call that, dietitian, and uh, Professor Naha, our sports physician therapist, who are very keen to help and, and help to sort of like initiate, help to advise this parent. However, a proper weight loss program, it is at the moment non-existent as yet in UMMC because I don't have the, uh, uh, what do you call that, um, um, uh, staff, uh, to be able to, to, to deal with this um, in, uh, uh, you know, in um, a program of such. Uh, but I would like to uh, let my team, uh, the uh, UM Health Buddies group after this to, to discuss and give you that opportunity um, to, to understand what we're we going to do next, hopefully in uh, recent upcoming years. Right, so what we can do is we can screen the children for type 2 diabetes, we can screen them for pre-diabetes status, we can screen for cardiovascular um, risk, uh, we can offer them, like what I've mentioned earlier, dietary sort of like advice. We can offer them uh, physical activity advice, what they can do at home. But these are all back to the parents and their family itself to, to be able to run and, and maintaining that uh, intensity and um, what do you call that? Uh, enthusiasm uh, at home to help these children. Okay. As for now, I have only metformin. Uh, to help them should they have any risk, meaning that if they have got insulin resistance, if they've got uh, fatty liver disease, then I can consider to start them with metformin to help with uh, to reduce that risk and also to reduce a little bit of body, body weight um, in, in, uh, in, in uh, children or adolescent with um, metabolic syndrome and uh, obesity. 
Otherwise, no, we don't use cybotramine, no, we don't do bariatric surgery. We don't really encourage massive weight loss in children. Uh, most of the time, we advise them to maintain that weight so that they will eventually grow into their centre. We promote healthy eating behaviour, we promote family issues, uh, family approach and well um, eating behaviour at home. Uh, for post-pubertal children, we do teach them a little bit about understanding calories uh, when they take every, uh, every day, what are the calories that goes in. And uh, um, we try to teach them about making sure that they should not exceed the, their calories restriction. We don't advise and uh, we don't advocate a very low calorie um, diet here uh, in children. So those are mainly for the adults obesity group, yeah, not for our children. At the end of the day, it's a multidisciplinary um, effort. Uh, family plays a huge, huge role in helping these children, and I'm sure helping the parents as well. Apart from that, as pediatrician and uh, primary physician, sports physician and dietitian will help to support this family to um, eventually help and, and uh, identify and, and help these children to get an ideal weight for this good uh, for, for, for their age. Okay, so if you can see, there are multi stages of uh, screening, uh, looking for risk, comorbidity, screening. The sports medicine team will come in to you know, advise on cardiomatically assessment and customization of act, uh, physical activity. So I have to acknowledge collaboration with Prof. Naha and his team. The dietitian plays a huge role. So Dr. Rokia, Cik Siti Hawa, Puan Hazlin, and Cik. Um, uh, I can't remember his name now, but, uh, you know, my dietitian have been, you know, following up very closely these children and, and, and they have that the same passion as I do to help these children. But at the end of the day, they see us only like three or four times in a year. And at the end of the day, their family is supposed to be well supported and, and motivated to help everyone. Um, bearing in mind today, I'm not talking any, um, you know, uh, just specifically in terms of um, uh, metabolic syndrome. I am not, uh, I have not mentioned a lot more in terms of other collaborations with our respiratory team, Professor Anna, Prof. Jesse, uh, Dr. Ake, in terms of looking at OSAS and asthma diseases in children with um, uh, obesity. I'm also, I have not also, uh, um, but I would like to acknowledge our liver team, Prof. Rosma, uh, Dr. Ting, uh, Prof. Yazid, as well as Dr. Rashdan in uh, Kota Baru, looking at NFLD in children with obesity. So those are also uh, consequences of the uh, childhood obesity. And um, so to just to end uh, the, the topic for today, so I, I think there's vast research opportunity in this category group of children. Um, there's a lot of epidemiology studies I've shown you uh, earlier on. Um, there's um, you know, a lot of things that have been done to show what can cause, what are the risk factors, what are the prediction towards you know, children who are obese, they can become adult uh, obesity and the consequences. Uh, but the treatment intervention uh, sector in terms of looking at uh, uh, children with obesity is lacking. And of course, we have not uh, had a good quality of life studies looking at children who are obese and having metabolic syndrome. Uh, in this um, in this region. So I think there's a lot of research opportunity. I mean, research is very important so that we can understand our um, need, our, 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 you know, need to help these children in long run and what we can do to increase awareness, uh, not just in the uh, healthcare professionals, but also uh, among the families. Um, so I thank you so much um, to everyone who's here today to listen to um, this uh, short talk. I would like to thank my team. Um, this was the last decent <laughs> pictures we had during the COVID time, uh, but we've had a lot of um, um, you know, effort and um, uh, trying to a lot to help with this in terms of these children. Um, so yes, thank you. Uh, shall I um, you know, um, stop the sharing and... Um, uh, hand the floor back to Lizian. Stop yes. sharing. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Prof. Yanti, for the yeah. very informative presentations. Actually, you highlighted that the obesity and metabolic syndrome among children is indeed very overwhelming in Malaysia. Yes. So previously, we always associate like metabolic syndromes as an adult's problem. And it's quite alarming to see that one in five children are indeed obese. And among all these obese uh, children, 20% are with metabolic syndrome. Yes. 
So yeah, I see that there's quite a lot of effort that uh, Prof Yanti <laughs> and team actually did in screening them and advice on the modifier risk factors. All right. So uh, Prof, you understand that you have a busy clinic to attend to. No, it's okay. So uh, yeah, we have quite a number of questions. So yeah, it's it okay. would be great if you can answer yes. it live after yes. the subsequent talks or yes. not, then uh, you may actually type in the answers to the questions sure. uh, in the Q&A box. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. And next, we would like to invite Ms. Narisa Hakim Azlan and Muhammad Faris Naim to share their valuable experience as a supportive, supportive peers, or we call it like buddies, to these children or adolescents with obesity as part of the weight management programs that uh, Prof. Yanti mentioned just now. So a bit of background. So Ms. Narisa Hakim and Mr. Faris Naim are both third-year medical students hailing from University of Malaya. They previously went to pediatric posting and notice that at times, children were not keen to divulge their eating habits when coming for follow-up. And however, this exact problem was actually tackled by having a younger peers to approach them. That's when the ball started rolling as more and more ideas came piling up. Together with their newfound colleagues and under the wisdom of Associate Prof Asriyanti, they formed a weight management program called the UM Health Healthy Buddies in order to keep all these kids in shape. So UM Healthy Buddies programs implements a buddy system to motivate adolescents through a structured two months programs via online platforms. So now let's welcome Narisa and Faris to walk us through this UM Healthy Buddies programs. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, share screen. Yes. Okay. It's Yes. So, hello everyone. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Horis, and there's my friend, my co-presenter Narisa. And for our topic, uh, before that, thank you to Dr. Holizian for such an introduction, and thank you for the to the Research e Carnival 2021 community committee for giving us uh, such uh, an opportunity to give a presentation in on this prestigious platform. So, our topic for today, myself and Narisa, is about tackling obesity amidst a pandemic and hopefully afterwards as well using a program called UM Healthy Buddies. So our topic for today will be the, divided into two parts, two main parts. The first one being introduction and literature review and the second one being about program and research. Program and research will be, will be told by Narisa after this. As uh, Prof Azranti has mentioned, we don't have a program specifically, a weight management program for for pediatric obese children. And this is what we are trying to aim for. Uh, this UM Healthy Body is what we, is trying to address that. So first to begin introduction literature review, as what Prof Azianti have mentioned just now, in Malaysia over one in every five children are either overweight or obese. And this is actually very worrying as, as Prof Azianti have mentioned, there's a list of complications that's bound to happen, diabetes, heart problems, ki uh, kidney problems, stroke. and all of these is associated with obesity. And if children as early as three, two years old have already gotten obese, you can just imagine what's bound to happen in the years to come. And we have to do something right here and right now. Globally, we also do, do as well because in an article from 2017, we rank at number nine when it comes to the world's fattest children. And another one in Southeast Asia, this is more recent from, but from UNICEF, like what Prof Azrian showed us. We ranked at number like second highest when it comes to obesity rates in Southeast Asia. So we really have to do something right now. But before we do that, we have to identify what are the causes of obesity. Prof. Azianti have mentioned, excessive nutrients, endocrine and metabolic genetic syndrome. The biggest elephant in the room is excessive nutrients, high calories, low activity, high input, low output. Primary obesity, second, because of excessive nutrients, is the biggest portion of the pie. And this is what UM Healthy Buddies is trying to address. Endocrine and metabolic genetic syndromes, uh, as Professor Anthony have mentioned, they are also significant, but these are but these two causes are not included in our research, and this is reflected in our inclusion exclusion criteria, which Narissa will explain later on, later on. But the thing is, excessive nutrients, this cause of child obesity is what UM healthy bodies is really trying to focus on. Are there are other risk factors as well that we specifically try to modify. The main three ones uh, is the one above. Uh, so from the left is parental obesity. The thing is, if one parent is overweight, 
there's four to five times more likely that their child will be obese. And if both parents are overweight, this risk increases to 13 times more. And this is what's said by Prof Yazid, our deputy dean for Faculty of Medicine. And this is something that we will address because we am Healthy Buddies will not just equip our pediatric patients with knowledge, but we also notify the parents as well and on the what's and don'ts, uh, on the hows and don'ts. And the second one is sedent sed sedentary lifestyle. This is also something that we want to address. As Professor Jantia have mentioned, internet usage is very rampant in our pediatric community. And we know that the more you use the internet, there's a, there's, it's also proportional to being sedentary and this is also addressed in our UM Healthy Buddies because uh, we also will reduce screen on time uh, through this program and another thing that is causing sedentary lifestyle because of, because of MCO I think all of us generally can see we have been fairly inactive as of late because of because of MCO and this is especially true for the kids because they are not going to school they are not going outside to play with their friends partly also because Parents are also fearful, afraid of COVID, so they are paranoid of letting their kids go, in, go outside when this is actually far from the truth. And this is what also, also something we would like to address through I'm Healthy Buddies, through online exercise and also at, uh, telling them to actually adhere to SOP and take a breath of fresh air outside. The other one that we also try to modify is excessive calories because, uh, because through I'm Healthy Buddies, we are also educating the kids why, what they should actually eat, what they should actually avoid, and so on and so forth. Two other things that, uh, and two other risk factors that I would like to mention, but this is not specifically for us, but is low socioeconomic status. This was, and this is some, some, yesterday there was a talk by Ms. Rihanna Yam and Professor Lucy uh, they, they, about their project of, they called the project Project Makan Sihat. And this was specifically for B40 toddlers. And this exactly, addresses childhood obesity as well, not only other uh, malnutritions, but also beef, uh, childhood obesity. And that is something that we actually have to support. The other one is high birth weight. And this has been mentioned by, and gestational, that mother gestation diabetes, and this has mentioned by Prof. Asiante again. Okay. So those are the risk factors. So we know obesity is very, is a, pediatric obesity is a big problem in Malaysia. What have we done so far? There are local programs that have been done one of, them, one of them is my BFF at school. My body is fit and fabulous. I wish I made that name. And that was uh, that. another one is Healthy Kids Program, both of which are curriculum-based programs integrated into schools. This, this is where we differ. We want to be a program that is a, is a mentorship program. We are a mentorship program. And we want to be something that can be, be prescribed by the hospital. This is where, and this one is integrated into schools. And both of these programs showed that uh, my BFF at school, there's a significant increase in health-related re health quality of life. This is good. The second one, Healthy Kids Program, the participants who have better knowledge about nutrition have lower rates of over being overweight and obesity. And this is what we really want to emphasize because this program, we really want to equip our pediatric patients with what they should actually know when it comes to uh, having a good diet, good exercise, and healthy lifestyle. Overseas, there are other programs as well. Uh, one from Canada is Healthy Buddies. I can assure you, uh, we are not inspired from this program, the UM Healthy Buddies and Healthy Buddies TM. This one is purely coincidental. And I can prove that because this one is a curriculum-based program like the two my, I've mentioned prior. Ours is a mentorship program. But their program also showed that there's a significant decrease in ZBMI and waist circumference. The other one, this one is similar, Fit Kids 360 from the United States. This program, they used medical students as mentors, but different from us, they only used medical students as the first one third, the first half of the program. Uh, we we want to use medical students throughout the whole program. And the, the good thing is they showed that they managed to reduce the amount of children that participate in that in their seven-week program. Our program is projected to be eight weeks. We hope so. So we know that we can at least see some uh, results uh, at the end of the program. So if you were to ask me, could we have a program specific, specifically, a weight management program to deal with this? Obviously, absolutely, we need something. Like Prof. Azrianti have mentioned, there's only one pediatric obesity clinic in Malaysia, and that's in UMMC. And they don't have the manpower to address pediatric obesity. They don't have the manpower to do, to carry out a weight management program. And that's where we come in, because UM Healthy Buddies is a nutritional intervention program. 
it, we are a program where there's a mentorship between medical students and pediatric patients so, so that we can motivate them to lead a healthy lifestyle, good, better diet, more exercise, whilst be also being compliant to what was prescribed by the hospital to them. This is what we aim for. And we are a pilot study. We are pioneering in a weight reduction program that we hope can be upscaled and prescribed by all hospitals nationwide. That's why we employ medical students because we have a lot of them. And that's it's a win-win situation because it helps medical students as well and also pediatric patients. So the aim of our study, which we think is very crucial, is because we want to see if such a program would be effective. Such body system, a body system and structured program would actually be effective in motivating children who are obese to stay compliant to their diet and exercise regimens. And we will measure that by looking at a lot, a lot of metrics, which Narissa will explain later on. So in conclusion, from my part, I just want to say that pediatric obesity is on the rise in Malaysia. We have to do something. And... One of the ways to do that is by doing this program, this weight management program. And the thing is, this pro there's no such program yet in Malaysia. We have personal trainers outside, but it's not really cheap enough for us to do. And this is how we can upscale that program nationwide so that we can prescribe this to our Malaysian children. And for that, I'll pass it to Narissa to tell you more about what is our program, actually. Thank you. Up to you, Narissa. Thank you very much, Naim, for explaining and uh, giving a brief introduction as to why we came up with this program and why we actually need it. So um, for my part, I'll be explaining the hows, just how exactly we'll, uh, we'll be conducting this program and how will it help combat pediatric obesity here in Malaysia. Okay. Uh, so um, here we have a look at our supervisors who have kindly agreed to guide us throughout the uh, planning of the program. So as you can see, um, all of them are from uh, different disciplines, which makes our program under the guidance of a multidisciplinary team. I want to say a special thanks to Prof. Jesse for coming up with the idea for the program. She actually came up with the idea um, whilst uh, seeing a patient at her clinic the other day. And I'd also like to thank Prof. Azrianti, Prof. Anna, Prof. Naha, and uh, Chit Siti Hawa for their help and their input throughout the full planning uh, of this program and this research. So here we have our committee members. All of us are actually uh, third year medical students from uh, the University of Malaya Faculty of Medicine. And actually another thing which encouraged us to carry forward and complete uh, and carry out this research is because uh, by the end of our third year, we'll actually uh, have to complete our research elective posting. And uh, we thought like, uh, why not uh, use that time to be fully dedicated to our program and make use of this as a learning opportunity during our research elective posting. So I would like to say a, a very uh, much a thank you to my colleagues for being committed uh, to planning this program. And here we have a few pictures uh, from our meetings, uh, which we've had since September actually, to discuss the structure of the program. So we've discussed um, how exactly we want to implement the body system. And I think uh, Prof Azrianti and Naim have uh, previously mentioned that uh, the Childhood Obesity Clinic here in UMMC is uh, one of the few places here in Malaysia that really looks into pediatric obesity uh, specifically, but it's only for screening. So there is no um, specific weight loss uh, training program yet here in uh, our hospital or in most hospitals for that matter. So we wanted to create a program that was easily accessible to the children, something that they can do from home, they don't need to come to the hospital very often, something that wouldn't be too much of a burden to them and we want to create an encouraging environment for them uh, to stay compliant to their diet and their exercise therapy. Here we have our, the type of study uh, that we'll be conducting, which is a cohort interventional study. Uh, and our sample size uh, for our study, uh, currently we have agreed on 50 participants in which uh, one medical student or one buddy will be paired to five patients. And our target for this study will be uh, obese and overweight pediatric uh, patients who will be recruited from the uh, pediatric obesity clinic under uh, the supervision of Prof. Azulanti, of course. And uh, currently, our control group uh, for this study will be patients uh, who, from the Pediatric Obesity Clinic who do not uh, want to be part of the program. So we'll be um, comparing the results at the end of study between uh, the participants uh, who involve themselves in the program and the patients who do not uh, involve themselves in this uh, UM Healthy Buddies program. 
So with every research, there needs to be a set of inclusion and exclusion criteria to ensure the safety of the patients whilst um, being part of this program, as well as making sure that this program is suitable for them. Uh, so for our inclusion criteria, uh, we have agreed on this age group um, from 12 to 18 years old because um, as I will mention later in the next following slides, um, our program will be um, mostly held online. So we need our participants to be familiar with platforms such as Google Meet and uh, WhatsApp in order to communicate with us uh, buddies later on in the program. And the next thing is our um, participants will have to have a BMI of 85th centile and above, and they must also have a follow-up at the sports medicine department and have seen a dietitian at least once. So why uh, they must have a follow-up is because uh, this is actually our target population. We want uh, patients who have already been prescribed their diet and um, exercise therapy, and they already know, and they've already received advice from their sports medicine physician and the dietitian as to what to do. Um, so our role as um, buddies or our role as medical students who take part in this program is only to encourage them to stay compliant to this already prescribed um, therapy. And uh, for these children also, they need to have smartphones available in the house uh, to communicate with the buddies. So this could be uh, either their own phones or even their parents' phones, uh, whichever is suitable for them. And uh, they will also need to be able to attend the first and second visit uh, at the MMC uh, hospital. So uh, I will explain a bit more about these two visits in the next slide. Uh, but first, I'll move on to the exclusion criteria. So I think as um, Naim has mentioned earlier, um, there are syndromes associated with obesity. However, we won't be including uh, participants who have these syndromes because this may affect um, factor into why the patients have or have not lost weight by the end of the program. And we want to make sure this uh, program is safe for them. So we won't be taking any um, participants who have skeletal complications of obesity. And another thing is that we want to make sure um, that uh, the participants are stable in stable condition and they do not uh, have to be hospitalized or need to go through any uh, surgery during the program duration as um, that would uh, uh, put too much pressure on them to be, um, to be part of this program and uh, it would be uh, quite hard for them to take part. So now uh, we'll move on to the methods. So just how exactly will this program be run and conducted? So there are four main components to our program. So firstly, um, the participants will need to visit um, the UMMC hospital at the start of the program and at the end of the program. So why uh, this is done? Because we want to take their consent, we want to take their demographic profile, take their anthropometric measurements, which consist of weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, um, get their body fat analysis, as well as the lung function test, um, in order to compare uh, those two um, measurements at the start of the program and at the end of the program. And another thing that we'll be doing is we'll be giving these participants a daily diary in order to record their compliance uh, to diet and exercise. So um, we will be basing uh, the diet regimen off of the Suku Suku Sparrow Regimen. So if you're unfamiliar, this is actually a guide for healthy eating that was uh, enforced by the health ministry in which a plate is divided into three parts. So half the plate will be for vegetables and fruits, a quarter of the plate will be for carbohydrates, and another quarter of the plate will be for protein. Uh, as for exercise, uh, the patients or the participants will need to uh, follow uh, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. So I'll uh, show you an example of the diary uh, later in the next slide. But first off, um, the other thing that we'll be doing for these patients is uh, providing, uh, contacting them through WhatsApp message twice weekly to ask about their diet and their compliance. Um, so uh, we will have a specific template prepared already in order to avoid a uh, straying, straying of the conversation and the uh, template that has been provided and uh, has been planned by my colleagues uh, is specifically uh, restricted to asking about um, diary completion, questions about the program and uh, mostly motivation, if there's any problems with motivation throughout the program. Uh, we will also be pairing uh, male buddies uh, with male participants uh, in order to make sure that uh, no romantic uh, relationships, potential romantic relationships are formed uh, by our, um, whilst communicating with them throughout this two month uh, program. Another thing and the final thing that we'll be doing for these patients uh, during the, this UN Healthy Buddies program is uh, giving them a weekly sharing sessions. So we plan to conduct this again online uh, via Google Meet and we plan to have them um, preferably every Saturday. So it will be 20 minutes maximum of a dietary session where we'll just be able to share with the participants uh, about healthy eating habits and just a bit about knowledge on um, their diet and exercise. 
and uh, we will have also a 30 minutes maximum of a Zumba session with the participants as well. Uh, we will be providing a, a short Google form um, filled with questions um, for the participants to answer before and after the sharing session, just to assess uh, their knowledge and, and assess their understanding of what was shared uh, during the session. Keep in mind uh, that our modules um, for this uh, sharing session will actually uh, be, uh, has already been prepared by our sports medicine physician um, and our dietitian, Prof. Naha and uh, Chase Siti Hawa. So the buddies will be um, trained according to that. Uh, and here uh, we have our um, example of our um, diary, which is broken down into two parts, diet and exercise. So compliance will be recorded um, for each meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I think you can see in this example, uh, the participants will need to tick the little boxes uh, that they have fulfilled. Um, if they have fulfilled um, each part of the plate with the correct amount of carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and vegetables and fruits. So for exercise, uh, if you can see uh, down here, we have it's divided into cardio, strength, and flexibility. So um, they will need to write down what exercise they've done for the day and according to which category. And they also need to record how many minutes they've done uh, the exercise for. So we've actually included uh, examples of types of exercises according to category in the front page of the diary, uh, but that's not uh, shown here in this slide. So that's just to um, make the participants familiar with um, the types of exercises according to category. Um, and also in this uh, example, we see that uh, there is a small little box for steps per day. And uh, we will be teaching uh, the participants how to use a pedometer app uh, using the, their mobile phones in order to record uh, their steps per day. And also there's another uh, column there, another small box for average time away from screen. Because I think um, Prof Azrianti as well as Naim uh, previously have mentioned um, that uh, screen time is a large contributor to why uh, children nowadays are uh, living a sedentary lifestyle, especially in this uh, current pandemic and um, staying at home season right now. So here we have our suggested time frame for our project and our program. Uh, we plan to have our program from November to December, so the full two months uh, from November to December, but uh, currently we're still awaiting um, uh, the approval from ethics. Uh, so we haven't actually started yet, but we hope to uh, start in November. And um, if you can see here, uh, the little rocket starts from September because we actually started planning this program uh, since September. And uh, we hope that if this program is a success and based on the research later on that we find that the participants have a good outcome and the program has had a beneficial impact on them. We hope to continue this in the long run and uh, make this program long term where we we'll, um, invite more medical students to be part of uh, this program and invite more participants uh, from the uh, clinic, pediatric obesity clinic to be part of this program. And finally, we have our expected outcomes. Uh, so this is like, uh, what do we expect uh, by the end of these two months? So uh, firstly, we hope to see an improvement in the anthropometric measurements. Uh, so we hope to see a 5 to 10% reduction in weight or body fat percentage as well as waist circumference. And this may be a bit difficult or challenging um, considering our program is only held, our pilot program is only held for uh, about two months, uh, which is why we will also be looking at lung function tests. Uh, to see if there's any improvement in that aspect. Uh, and the second thing that we we'll want to look at is compliance. So we want to, we hope to see that a majority of the participants uh, stay compliant throughout this program. And uh, this will be measured through our diary that I shared with you earlier. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for listening to us share uh, about this program that is very dear to our hearts. And uh, do feel free to ask any questions if you have any. Uh, with that said, uh, I hope that this program has um, your full support and we can uh, together combat uh, pediatric obesity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Faris, as well as Narisa, for sharing with us your interesting experience or stories about these UN Buddies programs, healthy Buddies programs. It's really fascinating to get to know about such a meaningful and impactful studies from the perspective of novice young researchers. So we do have a few uh, questions in the Q&A box, and I believe Prof Yanti has tried answering a lot of them, most of them. And yeah, there's one question um, for Narisa and Faris. 
So as a medical student, what do you value the most from this project? Is it the exposure or the impact of this project? Uh, hi, I'm Clarice. Uh, so for that question, as medical students, should what I value most? Honestly, what I really hope from this project is at least it will make an impact forward in the future. I want this program at least to be a basis, at least uh, some, somewhere to start on so that we will have a nationwide program, a uh, weight management program that everyone can use nationwide, every hospital can prescribe because looking at the statistics, look, seeing that more than one of, of five, one every five children are being overweight or obese is very worrying, especially since meeting patients, the patients themselves, we really feel, uh, it, uh, we, we feel bad for them because some, we, there must be something that we could do and we hope that this project at least in the near future can be realized into some can be upskilled into something that everyone every hospital can use yeah. that's from my part thank you thank you Faris uh, Narissa do you have anything to add on on that uh, I think yeah I, I agree with Faris I hope um, that this project does have a great impact and I think um, previously in the uh, presentation also, um, Faris has mentioned uh, that it's sort of a win-win situation uh, between medical students as well as uh, the patients from the pediatric obesity clinic uh, is because that medical students will have the opportunity to learn about more about pediatric obesity um, because um, we need to identify this very early on um, as Prof. Asriyanti said earlier, and uh, I think um, that would be very helpful uh, if we learn since um, our medical student years. Um, and, and this would be very helpful uh, to the patients as well if they have uh, a sort of um, someone, a, a buddy to guide them uh, through uh, staying motivated to their exercise and uh, uh, diet therapy. Yeah, I think it's a good exposure for them. I mean, uh, they, they learn a lot. They are also learning about research, which is, uh, I think, <laughs> a big impact, isn't it? A big, a big thing uh, in, in medical student, um, you know, um, life and era. But I think it's a good thing that they are involved in, with this. Uh, we thank you, Prof. Jesse and Prof. Anna for, uh, you know, initiating this idea. Uh, I can hear them screaming, oh, help me with my childhood obesity in, you know, clinic as well and respiratory clinic. And also, obviously, I'm also trying to shout. So far, I've been suffering in silence, but uh, thank you to these uh, young kids who are very enthusiastic to, to help this out. Yeah, I agree that we actually should start... Um exposing all these young yeah. students to research fields. Yeah, there's this one question about how obedient are the children in adhering to the diet advice by your team, Prof? And yes, I yeah, know. Maybe you... I answered that already. It's very difficult. Um, like I mentioned earlier on, I, I only see them three to four times a year. If, um, you know, like in, during COVID, I can only see them do it twice a year because most of the clinics have been postponed. So that's why these children are, these children, like that, these kids, are my two kids here and the, the rest of the UM Buddies team are, are thinking about this effort. It's very difficult to mentor them at home. You see, their parents are the one that, that needs to, to make sure that they, 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 they comply to exercise and diet. And it's difficult because parents are working as well. On top of that, um, uh, Lizian, can I just answer that uh, uh, one question about the higher income group? Why are we seeing that our children in Kuala Lumpur itself are getting more fatter? And then uh, is it the, uh, the rural, uh, of course, the rural areas are also, we are seeing that, that two suburbans as well as the urban uh, prevalence. Uh, but what we think is that for the um, poorer people or poorer socioeconomic uh, circumstances, what happened is that in our population, we have a, a high wheat-based uh, plant, uh, sorry, wheat-based, what we call that wheat-based um, food, like rice and noodles, okay? And these are very high, these are actually quite cheap. Our rice and noodles here in Malaysia is very cheap as compared to our proteins, yeah? So our proteins like chicken, fish, um, beef are actually quite expensive. Salmon is way beyond, um, you know, capacity of any middle income or, or B40 to be able to buy those things. So they tend to eat a lot of rice and a little bit, 
of protein to counter that that start, uh, that that hunger so that's why the the rural areas are also the you know the uh, uh, kita panggil apa orang kampung and orang um, suburban sorry suburban and the rurals are getting more fatter although they don't have that amount of money to buy you know this is not about fast food this is about not about mcdonalds or kfcs or anything like that it is actually the rice itself and the noodles itself the amount that they take is actually the refined carbs yeah as also the complex carb that they're taking a lot that's causing them to have uh, obesity so that's all from my side Lizian. thank you thank you prof for addressing on that yeah and i really agree that the um healthy buddies will actually be a very good program to try to keep track on them yeah. And follow I hope up this then. is a pilot study and hopefully at least UMMC being the first uh, hospital that provides this childhood obesity clinic, I hope we can have this type of program um, in future to help uh, my patient in the clinic. Yes, yes. We really wish all the best to the programs. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, do you have any last message or, or take home message? you would like to share with the audience um not much thank you so much for being such an engaging participant today for asking me a lot of questions i've answered most of them in the chat group uh q a session uh, thank you to the um committee for inviting us uh, thank you narisa and naim for taking up this uh, challenge to present in this uh, platform well done to both Right, I think, yep, so yep. I think it, I totally agree that it's indeed a very fruitful Q&A discussion sessions. So yep. audience can actually read up on the Q&A box for all the answers by Prof Yanti. And once again, I would like to express our utmost um, gratitude to all our speakers for these sessions, Prof Asriyanti, Dr. Subhash, Ms. Desiri, Ms. Narisa, and Mr. Faris for taking your time from your busy schedules to speak to us today. And thank you all audience for attending this morning sessions. I hope you have been inspired or at least learned something from all the talks today. So again, just a housekeeping notes, please remember to record your attendance using the link attached in the chat group. So with that, we conclude this morning sessions. So later on, uh, we have our day three afternoon sessions starting at 2 p.m. in which we will be looking at NGO partnerships in community based research involving the vulnerable populations as well as stroke rehab. So thank you once again for attending these sessions. So yeah, enjoy a good lunch and we shall see you again later on at 2 p.m. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you.